This is BBC News, I'm Julian Warwicker. The headlines at two o'clock. North Korea stages a huge military parade to mark the birth of the country's founder amid warnings over rising tensions with the US. You can actually feel the ground shake as thousands upon thousands of goose-stepping soldiers, tanks, rockets, other weaponry have marched and rumbled their way through the capital. Everton Football Club bans Sun journalists from its grounds following a column by Kelvin McKenzie regarding midfielder Ross Barkley. The mayor of Liverpool welcomes the decision. It's right that Everton have done what they've done, so I applaud that. And I think, uh, for me, I think the fans too will applaud that decision. And also in the next hour, the practical driving test gets a reboot. From December, learners will have to show they can safely follow a sat-nav before they can pass. And we'll be live in Turkey as President Erdogan embarks on the final day of campaigning ahead of tomorrow's landmark referendum. And then at 2.30, we'll be looking at how the city of Hull is being transformed by a year-long festival of arts and culture. Hello, good afternoon and welcome to BBC News. North Korea has warned the United States that it's ready to react to any provocative action. It comes as the country staged a huge military parade, displaying what appeared to be new submarine-based ballistic missiles. The US President Donald Trump has sent a naval strike force to the region because of concerns that North Korea is preparing to carry out another nuclear test. Well, our correspondent John Sudworth is with a group of foreign journalists invited to the capital, Pyongyang. His movements are being monitored and tightly controlled. It's an extraordinary sight. You can actually feel the ground shake as thousands upon thousands of goose-stepping soldiers, tanks, rockets, other weaponry have marched and rumbled their way through the capital city. This is a display of unity for the young North Korean leader. And it's meant, of course, to send a key message on the anniversary of his grandfather's birth, that his grip on power is unassailable. But as Donald Trump threatens to thwart his nuclear ambitions, it also sends a message to the outside world that this country's military, with its nuclear tests and missile launchers, is vital for its survival and military analysts will of course be poring over these pictures for evidence of the latest state of technological advancement of these forces there is that speculation that it may be preparing for another underground nuclear test i think it's probably unlikely that we'll see a test today but kim jong-un is making it absolutely clear that he is not prepared to negotiate away his nuclear weapons whilst being threatened and challenged by the United States. And experts believe that with missiles, with weaponry like this, they are just a few small steps away from having a real deliverable nuclear arsenal. And of course, once they reach that, once they reach that stage, it's a game changer in terms of the regional security situation and the global international diplomatic calculation about what can be done about North Korea's uh, military ambitions. It, it changes things for good. And the young man sitting up there in those stands has learned that lesson from his grandfather and his father before him. John Sudworth there in Pyongyang. Well, the US Vice President Mike Pence will be in South Korea tomorrow as part of a 10-day Asia trip. Steve Evans now reports from the capital, Seoul, on how the country is responding to events north of the border. You know, Seoul here is only 100 miles from Pyongyang, but it could be a million miles in terms of atmosphere. That big parade has been on uh, two of the channels here, but it doesn't get really big audiences. You get the sense that life here has just gone on as normal. The streets have been full of people on what feels like the first day of summer. 
The military here in South Korea has been studying those pictures of missiles and it reckons it does see developments in the long-range missiles. North Korea, the South Korean military thinks, is making progress. They've also picked up, experts have picked up on new kinds of tracked vehicles carrying missiles. And those matter because if North Korea can convey missiles around the country much more easily, it's much more difficult to hit them before they launch anything. So the sense of the common people is uh, life goes on. This continual barrage of rhetoric and threat from the North has been there since 1953, when the fighting between the two halves of Korea finished. But the military and the intelligence services look very intensely. Uh, on Sunday, we are visited by the Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence. And he will come here and he is expected to say that the alliance between the US and South Korea and between the US and Japan is ironclad, is the word that he uses. So the feeling here is North Korea is there in the background. We hear the threats, but we've had threats before. We're not panic buying. We're not planning on leaving the city, but we are concerned. I think that would be the mood here. Steve Evans in Seoul. Officials in Afghanistan now say that 90 Islamic State fighters were killed by a powerful bomb launched by the United States on Thursday, more than double the original estimate. IS has denied it suffered any casualties in the attack, which targeted a network of caves and tunnels in eastern Afghanistan. Everton Football Club has banned the Sun newspaper from its ground because of an article by the columnist Kelvin McKenzie. In it, he compared the intelligence of the footballer Ross Barkley to that of a gorilla. The mayor of Liverpool has called for the newspaper to sack him for making what he called racial slurs. Mr McKenzie, who denies the article was making racist comments, has been suspended by the Sun, as Richard Galpin reports. The controversial article published yesterday in The Sun has now led to Kelvin McKenzie being suspended. The piece about the Everton footballer Ross Barkley, whose grandfather was born in Nigeria, compared him to a gorilla and said the only other people in Liverpool earning as much money as Barkley were drug dealers. I've reported it to Merseyside Police um, and they're investigating um, the complaints. I've also uh, written to the Press Complaints Commission. The comments, I believe, were overtly racist, uh, showing a picture of Ross Barkley uh, with a gorilla. Um, knowing full well uh, Ross's heritage and his Nigerian uh, ancestry in terms of his granddad, I think it was a despicable comment. So now Kelvin McKenzie and the newspaper must wait to see if the police take the matter further. In a statement, The Sun's publisher, News UK, said it apologises for the offence caused and it was unaware of Ross Barkley's heritage and there was never any slur intended. Mr McKenzie says it was beyond parody to describe the article as racist. But if the newspaper, which he edited for many years, now admits the article was offensive, why did it allow it to be published? I would have thought that at The Sun they knew enough to make sure that, that Mackenzie didn't refer to Liverpool. It's uh, especially on the anniversary of the Hillsborough disaster. So it was a gross editorial oversight. And now Everton Football Club has just announced that Sun journalists have been banned from its football ground. Kelvin McKenzie's future as a columnist for the newspaper is very much in question. Richard Galpin, BBC News. Well, our correspondent Frankie McCamley is there at Goodison Park, Everton's home ground for us now. What feeling are you getting there, Frankie, about all this? Well, Julian, speaking to people and fans outside the club, a lot of them, as you can imagine, are saying that they are extremely happy with this decision to ban Sun journalists, not just from here, but from the training ground and any operations 
to do with the football club. Uh, just to give you an idea of the feeling of some fan groups towards the Sun newspaper uh, around here. When we arrived this morning, we were given this leaflet uh, and there are lots of banners just outside the club uh, where fans are. Uh, as you can see, saying Sun journalists are not welcome. We know in the local area a lot of news agents don't sell the newspaper and a lot of taxis we've seen have got this logo printed on them. And now speaking to the uh, the, the Liverpool mayor, uh, Joe Anderson, he's, he did call for a protest to take place. He's now said that doesn't need to happen. Uh, but there is, a, because now there is this real sense that uh, the people have spoken, the fans have spoken, the club has listened, and action has now been taken following uh, that article by Calvin McKenzie. And you talk, frankly, about attitudes to the Sun newspaper more broadly in Liverpool. And, of course, that takes us back to the Hillsborough tragedy, and it's the anniversary of that today. Well, of course, yes. Uh, just not far from here, uh, there's a service taking place at Liverpool Cathedral to remember those uh, 96 people who lost their lives. And we can't remember that a lot of people here, uh, a lot of families here will be arriving uh, today to come to this match uh, at a very sensitive time. So uh, the fact that that article was published at this time has really, really upset fans here, and they've been, they've been uh, letting me know that, a lot of them. OK. Frankie, thank you very much, uh, Frankie McCamley there outside Goodison Park, Everton's home ground in Liverpool. The family of a 20-year-old British student who was killed in Jerusalem have paid tribute to their daughter. Hannah Bladen, an exchange student, was stabbed yesterday by a Palestinian man with a history of mental health problems. Well, this afternoon, Hannah's family released a statement in which they described her as the most caring, sensitive and compassionate daughter you could ever wish for. She was driven and passionate and her death leaves so much promise unfulfilled. Our family are devastated by this senseless and tragic attack. A man is in custody over her murder. Police in Sheffield are investigating four unexplained deaths in the Barnsley area, which they think might be linked to heroin use. They're trying to find out if the deaths were caused by the strength and content of the drug being used locally. The three men and a woman were aged between 31 and 47 and were found at separate addresses. The Turkish president has been speaking to supporters ahead of tomorrow's referendum on major constitutional changes that could see him gain significant new powers. He's hoping to secure a yes vote, which would see the country shift from a parliamentary to a presidential republic. Well, uh, on the line from Istanbul, the BBC's Nula McGovern, who's uh, following events there. Just what's at stake in this referendum, Nula? Well... That's one thing that all the voters can agree on. They feel a huge amount is at stake. Some are calling it the most significant moment in this country's history since the founding of the state after the collapse of uh, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. So to put it in shorter terms, basically they're turning from a parliamentary republic to a presidential republic. Uh, Mr Erdogan, if he gets the yes vote that he wants, will dismiss the prime minister and appoint then a number of vice presidents. It will also change um, the three bodies, the judicial, the legislative and the executive branch. The detractors say giving too much power to Mr Erdogan, giving sufficient powers, the yes voters would say, to the country's leader going forward. So a uh, very divided city, although a lot of the posters I'm seeing are for yes, a lot of the people I'm meeting on the street are also saying no. It's expected to be incredibly close. Mr Erdogan giving a rally actually not far from where I'm speaking to you now, Julian, in that last push uh, for some votes uh, in this referendum that's considered the eve today of one of the most significant moments in this country's history. Yes, and as we talk, you mentioned the rally. We're showing pictures alongside you of Mr Erdogan on stage and, as you say, a very large crowd of supporters there uh, listening to him. Just a word about the response internationally to this. Clearly, there has been a lot of international interest because there have been uh, disputes in other European countries uh, about various protests and demonstrations and rallies that may or may not have been held. How close is this being watched abroad, do you think? Oh, incredibly so. I mean, the Turkish diaspora is huge. If we go to the Netherlands, even, for example, we're talking about 250 
thousand voters. I have spoken to one gentleman from there who is voting no. Uh, he very much felt that it was his country at stake and he felt also Turkey's place in the world. Of course, they're involved in so many issues, right? Whether we talk about Syria, whether we talk about the refugee crisis, whether we talk about Russia, Turkey and Mr. Erdogan is bang in the center. If we speak to yes voters, they feel that in fact, Mr. Erdogan having more power perhaps will make him even uh, uh, have a bigger bargaining chip with uh, other world powers and that he'll be able to push through some more issues in this country, make it safer, particularly when it comes, they feel, to terror attacks. This is a city that has been through terror attacks, that has been through an attempted coup and an ongoing purge of many of uh, the citizens in this country have been suspended or detained or jailed. So really an extraordinary time for the country. Indeed. Uh, Nula, thank you very much for the time being. Uh, Nula McGovern there in Istanbul. Time to bring you up to date with the headlines now here on BBC News. North Korea stages a huge military parade to mark the anniversary of the birth of the country's founder amid warnings over rising tensions with the US. Everton Football Club has banned journalists from The Sun from its ground following a column by Kelvin McKenzie regarding the midfielder Ross Barkley. From December, learner drivers will have to show they can safely follow directions from a sat-nav as part of an update of the practical test. Let's get uh, more on that story, the driving test, catching up with uh, technology after the Driving and Vehicle Standards Agency announced that learners uh, will have to demonstrate they can safely use a sat-nav. The agency says it's vital that the practical test keeps up to date, as our correspondent Judith Moritz now reports. Every motorist has been through it, the rite of passage of taking a driving test. But in future, learners will be examined on new things. The first driving test was taken in 1935. Clearly today's drivers are used to a very different road experience. More than half of them use sat-nav. And so the test has been updated to reflect that. So it's turning right out of the gate, okay. then continuing to follow the signs from the sat-nav. I went for a drive with Graham O'Brien, who helped develop the new test. Turn right, then at the end of the road, turn left. Drivers will have to follow sat-nav directions. So if we can incorporate it into the test, that will drive the training and get people more, you know, more familiar with dealing with that level of distraction as well, which we, we know is one of the biggest causes of accidents in the first six months with, with new drivers. Learners will also be asked to show they can cope with real-life scenarios, such as parking within a bay. We were often taking people down into, uh, into housing estates where they would be reversing around a corner and perhaps using up half a test doing some of these set-piece manoeuvres. The whole point really is to change all of that to get people a far greater experience of, of roads. The new tests have been trialled in some areas and will be introduced for everyone by the end of this year. Candidates will be asked to drive independently for longer, but the cost and length of the exam will stay the same, as no doubt will the nerves of those going through the process. Judith Moritz, BBC News, Manchester. Well, let's get some reaction to this. The CEO of the Red Driving School is Ian McIntosh, and uh, he joins me now via webcam from Beverley in East Yorkshire. Ian, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Julian. Uh, what do you make of these changes? Oh, I think they're tremendous. Uh, I, I think every road safety professional in the country is uh, very much in favour of this. It's, uh, it's going to require the, the candidate to demonstrate real-world skills uh, in a real-world situation. So it's a tremendous change. Uh, so the sat-nav element is an important part of this, you think? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it's very important uh, because that's what people do in real life. They get in their car and they follow their sat-nav, and particularly young people, uh, and they've never experienced that during uh, their training. Uh, so uh, to have that now as part of the training and indeed part of the test makes a lot of sense. Uh, likewise, presumably you would argue the parking space. I mean, parking is an element of the test already, isn't it? But this is a slightly additional part to that. Uh, it is. Uh, to, they've made space for additional things in the uh, test, and one of them is uh, bay parking. Uh, that might be pull into a bay in a supermarket car park, or it may be reverse into a bay, but then you'd reverse out uh, if you pulled in. So it's, 
again, it's a real scenario where that is exactly what uh, normal drivers do every day when they go shopping. Will Makes you, sense. Yes. W will you miss reversing around the corner? <laughs> uh, I know, I don't think anybody will miss that particularly, <laughs> no. Uh, you, we still have to demonstrate reversing, but not reverse around a corner. And it is in residential neighbourhoods. Uh, we do get complaints from people people quite I suppose uh, that live in those neighborhoods uh, and we'd like to learn a driver's practicing around the ideal corner that that won't happen anymore so this is a good development for uh, for those people too uh, the UK does have some pretty safe roads when you compare us to the rest of the world and that's clearly a good thing would you argue that this test will make those roads even safer uh, yes the the, uh, the the statistics for the UK roads are very good they're excellent and I would argue that in part that is because of the great training which ADIs uh, driving instructors across the country to deliver. Um, yes, this will help. This will help indeed because young people in particular are liable for or are likely to have an accident in that first year. And by having practiced and being trained and tested in real world situations, that will help enormously. In particular, the distraction of following a sat nav. Uh, which they may have never done until they set off on their own, having passed the test. So this is a really sensible development. OK. Good to have your thoughts. Thank you very much for coming on, uh, Ian McIntosh there in East Yorkshire. The National Union of Teachers annual spring conference continues in Cardiff today. It comes as a survey of just over 3,000 staff carried out by the union found that almost half of young teachers expect to quit the profession within five years. Increasing paperwork, longer hours and concerns over mental health were just some of the reasons cited. Well, our education correspondent Julian Hargreaves is in Cardiff. This entire conference and its sister conference, the NASUWT in Manchester, both are dominated by rows over funding cuts because teachers say that there isn't enough money to run classroom services in the way that they've been run in the past. The government in turn says funding has increased in cash terms to £40 billion this year, the highest figure ever. But teachers say there simply isn't enough money to go round and as you've just said, that's having all sorts of impacts, they say on teachers' workload, teachers' enthusiasm for the job even. So that's the, the, the frame in which all of the debate in these conferences is being held. But just a few moments ago, the National Union of Teachers here voted to increase industrial action against the government because of what it perceives as the funding crisis. And one thing that it may consider in the future, if it's not happy with the settlement that the government comes up with, is industrial action including one day of national strikes so that's something they've just voted on here but of course the government is is in negotiations it's holding a consultation on what's called the national funding formula that's the allocation of money that schools get across England and that consultation will continue for a while yet so it's not set in stone but there's real anger here about the cuts that schools are facing Julian Hargreaves there in Cardiff Competitors in England who take part in weekend fun runs will no longer be charged under new rules proposed by the government. The changes would make it illegal for councils to charge Park Run, whose events aim to encourage people to exercise. Britain's creative companies are urging the government to overhaul its approach to the sector as ministers draw up a national industrial strategy. They say British creativity is a big export earner and should be taken just as seriously as other industrial sectors such as car making. Here's our business correspondent, Rob Young. Advertising, filmmaking, music and video games. Britain's creative industries are well known around the world and financially successful too. More people work in the sector than in UK oil and gas or car making, areas which tend to get a lot of government attention. The trade body, the Creative Industries Federation, is demanding the government put creativity at the heart of the new industrial strategy. It recommends creative enterprise zones be set up, offering tax breaks and advice for startups on things like selling their services and products abroad. The organisation also wants careers advice in schools to be overhauled. It says current guidance is inadequate and misleading. The jobs of the future are going to require 
a combination of creative technical skills and that really needs to be hardwired into the workforce and will certainly go some way to meet some of the skill shortages in the sector from, from the domestic workforce. But also we will always, I think, be an international hub for creativity. The business secretary, Greg Clark, says he wants to build on the sector's strengths and is committed to doing a deal with the creative industry soon. As Britain heads towards the European Union exit door, cultural and creative companies are keen to push their case that British books, plays and TV programmes could also help Britain define its role in the world. Rob Young, BBC News. NASA scientists have released new global maps of the Earth at night, which they say give us the clearest view yet of the patterns of human settlement across the planet. The maps are created by stitching together thousands of cloud-free satellite images taken over many months. Sarah Corker has been taking a closer look. These images of the world in darkness have been dubbed the Black Marble. Cameras on board a NASA satellite are so sensitive they can detect light from just a single fishing boat or isolated street lamp. These pictures were taken in 2016. The satellite data creates beautiful images but also shows how humans have shaped the planet. This image shows Europe at night and if you look more closely you can see the boot-shaped peninsula of Italy and lights coming from its towns and cities. And if we move over to Africa, this is the River Nile. It clearly shows how people have built their homes along its banks. This is a daytime image of the area showing green fertile land and this is it lit up at night. The images have become a useful tool for scientists and researchers. They help to detect power cuts after Hurricane Matthew struck parts of the Caribbean and US in 2016. And in Syria, the UN has used the data to monitor the movement of people displaced by war. While the most recent Mount Etna eruption was also caught on camera from space. Next, NASA plans to release daily night images. They should help scientists to reduce light pollution, monitor unregulated fishing and even track sea ice movements across the world's oceans. Sarah Corker, BBC News. And now some news just coming in, various agencies reporting, and I'm quoting Reuters here, that are talking about an explosion near to a bus convoy waiting to enter the Syrian city of Aleppo. Uh, we're talking about people being either killed or wounded uh, as a result of the explosion, and this is being reported by both pro-government media outlets and pro-opposition activists. Um, the blast, Reuters say, hit specifically an area on Aleppo's outskirts where dozens of buses carrying mostly Shiite residents of two villages that are being evacuated in a deal between warring sides and those kinds of deals have been happening in recent days. These buses were apparently waiting to enter the city. Uh, Syrian state television said an unknown number of people had been killed or wounded. So clearly more details on that coming in uh, as I speak and we'll bring you up to date on that in the next half an hour or so. Uh, let's uh, check on the weather forecast now and uh, head across to the other side of the newsroom to hear from Ben Ridge. Ben. Hi there, Julian. Thank you. Good afternoon to you. Still time to get out and about for a Saturday stroll. And the weather for most of us actually not looking too bad. Not like last weekend when we had temperatures well up into the 20s, but there is still a fair, a fair amount of fine and dry weather out there. Some blue skies, some patchy cloud. That was the scene earlier on in Shetland. And as we go through the rest of the day, we will see some showers as well, particularly through Northern Ireland, Scotland, Far north of Scotland, uh, those showers could contain some hail and some thunder. One or two showers further south, but a lot of dry weather here. 15 degrees in London. Now this evening and tonight, it'll get quite chilly under clear skies and then a change from the west. Cloud increasing through Northern Ireland, Western Scotland. Some outbreaks of rain starting to work in here. Eastern areas seeing a touch of frost. West skies stay clear for longest. Tomorrow it is this central slice of the UK that is likely to see some rain at times, even cold enough for some hill snow over the high ground of the Pennines, maybe southern Scotland. Southwest of England, far south of Wales, should stay largely dry, fairly mild here. Chilly with sunshine and showers across the north of Scotland. And then for Easter Monday, there'll still be some showers around, some sunny spells as well, and on the cool side. Bye-bye.